that better? Yeah. yeah. Amateur Deep Space Reception by Paul Marsh, M0EYT. Um, the usual housekeeping, I'm sure by now we all know where the fire escapes are and if the fire alarm goes off, etc. Um, so, an introduction to Deep Space Mega DX. The equipment needed and the techniques used to identify extremely weak signals coming from man-made space probes in various parts of our solar system. X-band, or 8.4 gigs, is the primary band of discussion, but Paul will also briefly talk about S and KA reception equipment and antennas. You can receive signals from spacecraft in excess of one billion kilometers with a modest sized dish in your garden. If you have an interest in EME or microwave weak signal reception, Amateur DSR can help you push the limits of what is possible with home-built equipment. Paul. All right, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, apologies for my throat. Had, uh, it's nothing to do with alcohol. It's, um, there is a, a genuine excuse. But anyway, so introduction to Amateur DSN. Um, these are the areas that I'll be uh, chatting briefly about. Um, some, a, a few slides on uh, spacecraft that I've heard. Um, there, there are a few of, a few of them, but I'm not going to bore you to death with uh, hundreds of uh, waterfall pictures. So there's a few highlights and a bit of a discussion about the hardware um, that you need, as well as the antennas and what have you. So as said in the intro, um, primarily we'll be talking about 8.4 gig. Um, there are a couple of other bands which are of interest if you're uh, interested in microwaves. Um, these are 2.2 gig S band, and then the KA bands mainly at 32, and some near-Earth stuff at 26.5 gig, but that is um, generally uh, reserved for the lunar uh, reconnaissance orbiter. So why would you want to do uh, amateur DSN? First of all, if you like uh, fiddling around with stuff and... Uh, Weak, anything to do with weak signal and software-defined radio, then this is an area which is uh, certainly interesting. It does offer uh, some of the challenges that you get with um, EME, uh, but without the transmit side of things, so there's only half, uh, half, of the, half of the system to worry about. You can hear some very weak signals from man-made things that are pretty far away, and as said, get some uh, quite good DX. This is very different from radio astronomy, um, when I'm not listening to, to noise from a, a lump of gas. This is something from a, a man-made spacecraft, which is, uh, for, in, for instance, in orbit around <coughs> Jupiter. There's a lot of people which are interested in amateur DSN, and we have a small community uh, with about 866 uh, other members. So all of this uh, started at the Martlesham Microwave Meeting in 2005, and the uh, AMSAT guys here, James and Freddie, had a demo with a very small antenna, 90 centimetre, showing some uh, signals being received off air from Venus Express and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And because I'm fairly interested in stuff which is uh, coming from satellite, or, uh, you know, uh, be it whatever comms uh, you can imagine, um, this, as far as I was concerned, was the next level. So it's OK having done satellites in orbit around Earth, but I want to hear stuff in orbit around Mars and Venus. So um, a bit of natural progression. The other thing which hooked my uh, interest was this statement from NASA. And they basically say that our old rubbish cannot detect such weak signals. And uh, no, uh, pe people um, who are technical don't like to be told what they can't do. So um, that was a, a good driver. So before we uh, talk about the small uh, ground station you can have in your garden, um, there's a few slides on some of the, uh, the ground stations that the professional use. use. Uh, this is split into ESA, European Space Agency, and uh, NASA sites, so we won't go through all of these, but the, um, the, the crux of the issue here is that the ESA sites have a few antennas, um, mainly 35 metre, 15, 12, and th uh, 3. So this is the sort of thing that you can have in your garden. If I tried to put that up, I'd get a raised eyebrow from the wife, probably. <laughs> Only the eyebrow. Only the eyebrow, yeah. Yeah, she has been accustomed to oddities, shall we say. Um, at the NASA site, so they have uh, three ground stations which are spaced at approximately 120 degrees around the planet, and that is, of course, to uh, have fairly continuous coverage uh, from space. 
and each of these uh, ground stations has a 70 meter. Uh, this was originally a bit smaller, about 64, but had um, uh, additional, I guess, extension petals fitted. A couple of 34s and a, a 26 meter dish. And these are the antennas which, for example, would receive traffic from uh, Voyager or the Cassini probe before it deorbited, uh, things like this, so where you need high data rates from spacecraft which are fairly far away. So all of these antennas um, operate in the three bands that we've talked about, SX and KA, but NASA are moving towards a 32 gig band, but with that comes a whole world of pain in terms of antenna beam width, pointing precision, uh, etc. So um, some of the bigger antennas, for example, the uh, 70s are not used on KA, but the smaller 34s, etc., uh, would be. So uh, some antenna gain figures and uh, some general figures for a typical uh, NASA 70 meter antenna. Um, maximum uplink power, obviously not going to pretend to read that out, but you can see that's a, uh, a, a high ERP. Um, the antenna gain, you know, if you compare this with LF stuff that might have sub 10 dB, you can see that there is um, a fair amount of gain at uh, mid 8.4 gig. The 3 dB beam width, uh, 0.03 to a degree. So obviously pointing pre precision has to be uh, adequate. And uh, receive a noise figure. So this is a cryogenically cooled uh, low noise amplifier with about 12 uh, dB uh, 12 Kelvin of uh, noise figure. So a little bit better than amateurs can attain, but you can still do quite a lot with um, not much stuff. In terms of uh, frequency stability, so to put it into perspective, if you're trying to receive a signal from, uh, let's say, uh, the Juno spacecraft, you know it is at Jupiter and you know where Jupiter is. You can calculate the as and L and you know the relative speed between you and Juno, or, or the spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter, and from that you can determine the Doppler shift, and from the Doppler shift you can determine the frequency. So when you look on your waterfall, you don't want to look in something a meg wide because you simply won't see the signal. You have a span of 5 kilohertz or 2 kilohertz, and at 8.4 gig, you need to be very sure where you're tuning. So the other thing we have, and obviously NASA have uh, orders of magnitude better, are very good uh, quality local uh, station um, oscillators. In our community, I guess we operate at uh, 10 meg. Um, some of the NASA DSN sites have um, interesting oscillators. That is not necessarily at 10 meg. Some of them are 100 kilohertz distribution, which is a bit uh, of an odd frequency, but they are, um, are distributed via fiber between sites uh, to ensure frequency coherence. And you, you can see the um, stability. This is from the uh, NASA paper, um, which shows you the general deviation over large numbers of seconds. In the amateur world, we can't really get close to that. But you can do things like make a stable oscillator, steer it with GPS, have good time constants, put it in a cool box, make sure the environment around it doesn't fluctuate too much. And you can get down to you know, a, a hertz per day or something like that drift, which is uh, adequate. So some of the other interesting uh, data that you can get from the, Nash, uh, the NASA uh, Deep Space Network is um, this publicly available website, which is uh, called the DSN Eyes, and it shows you an illustration of each antenna and what mission uh, it's talking to. So you can see here DSS-25 is talking to Voyager 2, um, or two antennas are talking to Voyager 2. There's one sta uh, standing by for uh, New Horizons here. Um, but for us, this isn't much good because we need the proper information as to what NASA's doing, what frequency they're tuning to, where they're pointing. But luckily, this is driven via data that you can quite easily get to. So uh, one of our IRC uh, colleagues wrote a parser for this, and this takes the same data, which feeds that um, lovely graphic and presents it properly. So you can see uh, receive frequency down to a hertz accuracy, the receive signal strength, um, th this is very handy because you can uh, measure your own system and work out what the uh, minimum discernible signal is. And there's various other uh, parameters. So for um, the DSN Madrid site, you have pointing data, and it means you can slave your antenna at home uh, from Madrid to track uh, as they track. So that leads us on to the antenna pointing uh, 
section. So we're talking about um, spacecraft that you obviously can't see. Some of them may not necessarily be in orbit around a planet that you could see through a telescope. How, therefore, do you uh, work out where to point your antenna? And the answer is the online ephemeris tool uh, called Horizons, and that basically is a solar systems dynamics pro uh, uh, page. And you can type in where you are, your altitude, um, whether you want an airless refraction model, and lots of parameters I don't understand. But uh, you can tell it what um, thing you want to track, and it produces this big chart which shows you the time and the date and where to point your antenna, how far away the thing is that you're uh, interested in talking to, and the speed difference between you and the thing you want to track in kilometers per second, which you then use to compute frequency, and then one-way light time in minutes, um, and that's how, how long it takes a uh, signal at the speed of light to get from the thing you're talking to to um, your antenna. So in the bad old days at home, um, th this was a bit painful. It was put up temporarily in uh, 2005 and lasted for uh, too long. But um, the issue here was you had to take the chart, go outside, take 360 off the uh, wanted azimuth because the ring was um, inverted in terms of uh, calibration, measure the elevation with a precision protractor, point the antenna ahead a couple of minutes, go back indoors, set the RF stuff up, repeat every three or four minutes. Um, on the day of the, uh, the um, Rosetta landing, the weather was miserable and it was just a miserable experience, having to go out, be rained on, all this stuff. But to catch the signal was worth it. So it has uh, changed a little bit. Um, this is the antenna uh, as it is now. Um, obviously, this is a sped up uh, video which shows one day's worth of tracking. Um, the antenna here was slaved off a Madrid Deep Space Network antenna as it was doing its mission tracks, which is why occasionally you can see it um, briefly go off of a target and then come back onto it as they're doing a background noise measurement or uh, something like that. So very nice, fully automated. It's, um, I've become a user now, so I just want to point and click, and I want something to happen. So this has a, a fairly reasonable degree of pointing accuracy, and uh, more importantly, it works in the rain, and I don't have to go outside and get wet, which is great. So for the ephemeris data we talked about, you can go to the website, type all the stuff in, and uh, it produces lists of um, pointing data, but it's far easier to write a simple uh, script which automatically does this once a week. So I uh, won't go through all of this, but basically it has a list of things I'm interested in, and the script processes it and spits out the data and dumps it on the network uh, drive, and then the machine which steers the antenna takes this data, sets the receive frequency, so it almost is at the point where it's fully automatic. Um, this is at the F1 EHN uh, control panel, so it would be familiar to those of you that um, uh, play with EMI stuff. And this is the uh, user interface. So here you can select the object that you're interested in, um, uh, spacecraft or planet. Um, here's the uh, ASL readout, and this is where the antenna thinks it is. So you can see that there's you know, 0.02 degree of azimuth uh, error and no elevation error. So uh, very handy, fairly simple to put together. Um, for the receive system, so we we'll talk a bit about the microwave front end and how that uh, developed. So in the good old days, this was um, a very first attempt with a uh, eBay oscillator, and our very very noisy uh, phase noise was um, horrific. With this system, I could just about detect a beacon signal from a geostationary satellite, which is very close. It's almost visible. Um, a lot of work had to be done to get from here to be able to receive uh, some of the weaker stuff. But there obviously are, like any project, um, numerous iterations of stuff. Um, it's still not in a final state because it's, you know, it needs to be uh, tweaked occasionally to get um, another 0.1 of a dB of uh, performance out of it. But it does go through various iterations. What you can see on the board here is um, roughly the same as a block diagram for an LNB you would have on your sat TV dish at home. Um, this is obviously a homemade version. I can't integrate it to that uh, level, but what is done here is exactly the same as a satellite LMB. Take a high-frequency input up in the X-band in this case, 
select which bit of the band you want, either Millsat or Deep Space, have a mixer chain and some synthesized uh, oscillators, and then an out, uh, a reference input from the uh, shack reference, and then the IF output goes to the software radio and the comms receiver for processing. So this is a screen, a uh, photo of what it actually looks like, and you can see the uh, usual semi-rigid plumbing and some waveguide, uh, not waveguide, some microwave filters at the front with some switches and the two uh, die-cast boxes contain the oscillator, so it's all fairly straightforward stuff. On the front end of the dish, so this would be the equivalent to the front end of the uh, LNB on your uh, Sky system, but homemade version. So there is um, B&Q 28mm waveguide is uh, used here, which is perfect for X-band, a um, home-built low-noise amplifier, and a Super V4MA feed, which um, illuminates the dish very nicely. So uh, here's a shot of the uh, LNA, so it's um, very good. It's uh, on a par with a DB6NT um, 8.4 gig LNA and has got a reasonably good noise figure and a fair bit of gain. And uh, it was a project between myself and uh, Ivan in Spain to um, produce this. I did the mechanics, he did the uh, noise figure optimization. So this is the antenna um, which is currently in the garden. Um, I'm not allowed uh, for... Uh, political home reasons to have the extender petals on all the time. Uh, the wife doesn't find it acceptable. So um, I have to have the uh, normal antenna, uh, the 1.8 up most of the time. And then for steering, um, there were some of these units available a few years ago. They were originally from a warship and they steered a big EW ar array uh, around on the side of the boat. But the original use, you know, it's a heavy array of about 100 kilos, and it's the sort of thing that if you're stood next to it and somebody fires an exit set at your boat, it would knock you over the side because of the, uh, the, ra the rate of turn. And for my application, that was way too high. I want precision rather than uh, acceleration and rapid uh, moving. So there was a little bit of engineering effort required to replace the old motors with uh, motors with integrated gearboxes and to replace synchro resolver uh, position encoders with um, you know, uh, current century digital encoders that can talk to the tracker. Very nice hardware. Um, you don't really see mu uh, many of these um, on the surplus market. Uh, I saw some this year at the Newbury um, boot sale, but they were four to 500 pound each, which um, realistically is a bargain considering what you get, but uh, s still expensive. So uh, this is the dish um, at home as it currently stands. Um, I got the kids to uh, dig the hole because they like digging in the garden. So uh, might as well make use of that and say, dig a big hole for a, a dish to be planted in. So there's um, a, a steel pipe, about, um, six foot high, uh, which is quarter inch uh, wall and some uh, caps welded on the uh, top and bottom. The antenna can do 360 as by 95 elevation, has reasonable uh, pointing accuracy and uh, even the wife approves of it. So compared to the previous one, which was a tripod and a mess, um, she said, oh, well, that looks much nicer. So as far as I'm concerned, that's um, a, a, a win. So also on my uh, antenna, as we mentioned earlier, um, we will cover a very small amount on KA. It's, um, it's a difficult band with limited test equipment, so it has a passing mention. But there is um, this down converter uh, which can be attached to the front end of the dish. Um, this is 8 millimeter uh, pipe, again, uh, B&Q microbore heating pipe, um, which happens to be perfect for 32 gig and uh, big synthesized uh, down converter um, at the front end. For um, local stuff out to, say, 5 million kilometers, you can use a small 60 centimeter dish and uh, get good results. So in, I thought I'd put a picture of this in. This is the front end um, amplifier inside the KA LMB. It's very small, so 1.8 by 0.8 millimeters, but it covers our 32 gig band perfectly with a 3 dB noise figure. You might say that is um, rather high in terms of noise figure, but a 32 gig, that's actually a gift. So it's uh, fairly good. Um, in the shack at home, there is this uh, distribution amplifier. This takes um, a 10 meg input uh, somewhere from a uh, GPS steered oscillator and then has a number of isolated outputs which feed software radios, test equipment, down converter, uh, etc. Um, all of them are transformer coupled so there's no uh, earth loop problems, uh, etc. And it, it seems to work okay. So 
from that box which you saw the microwave plumbing in, the output of that um, is an IF, uh, so down converted uh, 8 gig, and that generally comes out around 100 to 900 meg, and that's tuned by a uh, AR5000 COM receiver, and uh, the output of that goes to a software defined radio. Okay, so uh, you'll all be familiar with SDRs. You can see um, in a, a, a particular bandwidth, a peak, and then a waterfall of historic uh, signal. So here, the reason that is uh, not a straight, is a straight line, but is at an angle, is because of the uh, acceleration or deceleration between my ground station and the spacecraft. So another nice thing about um, moving everything into uh, the software um, world is that you can do uh, interesting things to the signal. So you can see here um, a carrier from the Juno spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter. And this is, I wouldn't say barely perceivable, it's very easy to see, but you can see it is weak. The obvious thing to do with this would be to stack samples on top of each other so you can uh, average the signal. And with signal averaging, um, there's a, uh, uh, some parameters here. Add 20 or 50 samples over the top of each other, and you can clearly see that it's brought that way out of the noise. So that improves your uh, detection rate. So some of the first signals. Um, this down converter, you can see, it is not really what I would call a production version. It's hung off bits of wire off the feed arm of the dish. But this was the very first experiment to receive uh, Venus Express, um, which was about six million uh, kilometers away. There's a uh, uh, phase locked oscillator, a waveguide filter, and a mixer, and some amplification. All very straightforward. Uh, this is an old Marconi satellite TV LMB that had been repurposed and tuned down a couple of gig to 8.4. And as you can see, with a spacecraft um, so close, the signal is enormous and very easy to uh, see in the waterfall. So the next spacecraft um, of my interest was MRO. Um, th this is, uh, I would not say this is DX, um, 72 million K. It is fairly close in terms of terrestrial DX. It's reasonable, uh, or, <laughs> sorry. It's uh, uh, unobtainable in, uh, in terms of terrestrial DX, but when you've got line of sight to the spacecraft, it's obviously a little bit easier. Um, you can just about see the outline of the antenna and where Mars was, which are a very clear night, but uh, extremely cold. And uh, anyway, so here is an uh, artist's impression of MRO. Um, this is very nice. 100 watts of carrier to a three-meter dish is obviously going to be quite a loud signal, even though the distance is uh, significant. So um, first signal, uh, 10th of December 2005, 72.6 million K. And you can see that is a whopping signal, um, just about detectable in the headphones, but on an FFT display, very, very easy to uh, copy. OK, so uh, I've got a few slides. As I said, there's a number of spacecraft. I won't bore you to death with um, all of them, but there are a few highlights of stuff that has been uh, received. So you can see a bit of a gallery of uh, some of the interesting things in the past, um, one of which was a solar sail. Uh, this was particularly interesting because the um, X-band transmitter was at the edge of the sail. And when the sail was unfurled, we could, by Doppler measurement, work out the diameter of the sail, which um, was, yeah, you, you know, you compare it with the press pack, and it comes out to within uh, six inches of um, actual. So uh, that, that's just based on radio ops. So here is a uh, FFT from Stereo B. This is the... Um, solar observatory spacecraft that's currently broken and it is undergoing recovery efforts but this is on the day of launch it's extremely close you know um, a million K and you can quite easily see sidebands this would be very simple to decode because it is uh, so close um, Osiris Rex so this uh, I don't know if you follow um, spacecraft in the news but this had a gravity assist swing by very recently and this was the um, signal from it. Again, quite a loud uh, carrier. Um, another shot of Stereo A when, it ha when it's out at its operating um, position. So uh, 263 uh, million K. And uh, this is quite nice because it's a spacecraft that is so loud, you can use it as a, a sanity check for your uh, DSN system. 
and uh, this is very easy to copy uh, in the headphones. So um, most days I point the stereo A, can I hear it in the speaker? Yes, system's working and there's uh, a spider hasn't moved into the feed or, or something like that. So I don't know if you saw the uh, talk first thing about the uh, Rosetta mission, very, very interesting, and about the landing. Um, a few of us who have our DSN systems at home watch the landing from an RF perspective. Um, you could see the carrier uh, here on the approach to the comet. And uh, here, there's an abrupt stop, and that is the point of uh, the landing. The nice thing about this is that you have 30 to 40 seconds of heads-up knowledge between um, those people watching on internet because of the codec delay um, and uh, those people that are receiving it directly. So three or four of us uh, heard it, and it was um, a sad day to see the carrier disappear because this is not something you... Uh, really ever see on um, X-band, the, the end of a, a mission. Where was Rosetta? So I'm here. The thing in, that we never see in this country is here, the sun, and Rosetta is about here. Just to give you a perspective. Um, Mars Express, this is a, a European sp uh, Space Agency spacecraft on orbit at um, Mars. Again, this is something fairly easy to copy. And uh, you can see the signal is uh, quite large, but you may be wondering why the carrier uh, steps like this. And that is purely to do with the uh, type of oscillator which is on board the spacecraft. And uh, it has a bit of jitter, and occasionally you see it uh, wobble. So Dawn spacecraft, there is a, um, another lump of rock called Ceres, which is, a, uh, I think, an asteroid and that's about half an hour in terms of light minutes uh, distance, so fairly uh, far away. This was a um, medium length track, and you can see the wobble caused by the orbit of the spacecraft around this uh, lump of rock. But this is a, an absolutely enormous signal, very easy to copy. Where is it? So I'm here, there's the sun and um, orbit of Mars, and it's here. So uh, half again on where it is. Uh, Half again, further away as Mars. Um, Juno spacecraft, so this is uh, currently operating in orbit at um, Jupiter. It's fairly uh, far away at present. This was shortly after launch. You can see a wobble on the carrier. Again, the reason for this is because the feed horn, um, so a hemispheric coverage, the spacecraft has just been launched. It is in a, a thermal um, barrel roll to make sure the electronics are at a stable temperature and the wobble is caused by the rotation of the, the dish with the uh, feed at the, um, at the outside diameter and uh, it not being exactly pointed at Earth. So again, quite an interesting um, experiment to work out the difference between Doppler max and min, uh, correct, uh, average it, work out the a uh, antenna diameter. Where is Juno now? Uh, there's the orbit of Jupiter. There's the Mars orbit, and there's the Earth orbit. So it's um, not bad DX. So this is what the signal looks like uh, at the moment. Um, this is Doppler compensated and averaged. Um, 41 minutes of light time. You can work out how far away that is um, very simply. But um, it, it's uh, adequate DX. So this, um, this is Cassini. Uh, you'll be aware that the mission has ended um, with a... Uh, uh, a dive into the atmosphere at Cassini. Um, this is currently my all-time um, DX at 1.36 billion K, and this is using the uh, 2.4 metre dish in my garden. You can clearly see the uh, carrier and the uh, Doppler profile. Now, this particular signal was received on um, the bank holiday of May uh, this year. I don't know if you remember it. Um, I was up at 1 o'clock in the morning, scrabbling around in the shed doing uh, this. And uh, it was thunder and lightning, high winds and rain. And it was not optimum weather. So I'd done a back of envelope calculation on the um, receive signal and uh, had a local station reference a couple of kilohertz away. So I had a sanity check. And uh, it was early in the morning and I'd um, made a mistake and it was out by a factor of 10 dB. So when I saw this signal here, I thought initially that can't be Cassini. It's a very, uh, it's, the distance is great. 
and uh, I must have made a mistake, so it must be something drifting. But uh, on-off tests um, proved that it was actually from Cassini, and uh, I've been looking for this spacecraft for 10 years, so it was worth um, getting up. Um, as far as orbits, you can see Jupiter is positively close, and uh, Saturn at the time was about twice the distance away. So um, managed to make a, a recording of the FFT uh, signal and embed it into this uh, presentation. You can see the carrier here. What was very interesting during the reception is that you could see gaps in the carrier. And uh, initially, I thought, OK, that's very interesting. I wonder if the spacecraft is in a data mode where the uh, power was being put into sidebands I couldn't see. In fact, um, you can see uh, dips here. But the type of orbit or the uh, time in the type of uh, the time and the type of orbit was when the spacecraft was flying between the planet and the uh, rings of Saturn. And what you're seeing is attenuation caused by lumps of rock between my antenna and the spacecraft. So even with a small dish at home, you can have uh, quite a bit of fun looking at stuff um, on other planets. So uh, a little bit closer to home, a uh, few years ago, the Chinese uh, launched two um, craft to the moon, the Yatu rover and the Chang'e 3 uh, lander. Um, this was a signal recorded from uh, the moon shortly after touchdown. And uh, it's a nice, strong signal with telemetry. Um, shortly after it, it uh, landed, there was a, um, it drove around a bit, and then there was a fault. And they had to fix it by uploading some new uh, firmware and rebooting it. And the interesting thing is, on this diagram, the reboot happened here. So this is the normal, uh, this, this is um, noise going into the modem on board the spacecraft. And then after the micro comes back and starts spitting out valid uh, telemetry frames, you can see the normal data um, resuming. So this was very interesting. I made a post of this on Twitter. And then a fellow nerd somewhere in Russia came back and said, you've caught a spacecraft being rebooted on the surface of the moon. Well done. That's our uh, quite an interesting thing to see. So with some of this data, we sent it to um, one of our IRC guys who's a bit of a, um, a, a DMOD nerd. And by stacking the frames on top of each other, it was possible to um, extract some data from the Yatu rover. Um, you can pull out certain information from this frame. So there's a CCSDS ID, which confirms that it's Chang'e 3 x which is the auxiliary spacecraft, i.e the uh, Yatu rover, and then there's other things which we found in documentation about the particular sync word, and you can see some telltale uh, telemetry signs, so synchronization word, a counter, and lots of other uh, data. We did um, compose an email to the Chinese Space Agency and said, can you send us the user handbook for Yatu, and in particular the um, telemetry uh, guide, and what uh, bits do what, and uh, funnily enough, there was no answer. <laughs> so uh, a little bit irritating, but um, to be expected. So whilst, uh, whilst watching the um, X-band signal from Yatu, it occurred to me that it would be very interesting to see whether you could see command uplink. So from a ground station in China, they're commanding the Yatu rover. Um, my uh, X-band system can be adjusted in terms of band. So I switched it down to the Millsat band. And on 7.202 gig, you could see the reflection of the uplink um, to the moon commanding the rover. This, the signal was so loud in FM, it was quieting, uh, you know, an e enormous signal. It's something you would never hear on amateur EMI, even from uh, very big antennas. So there were probably kilowatts going up uh, at this point. So just one slide on um, the Kepler exoplanet mission. So this is a spacecraft which basically catalogues the brightness of various stars and uh, does a round robin to, you know, it looks at this star, measures the brightness, that star measures the brightness, and then over a period of time it can work out if things are flying in front of the stars, i.e. planets, um, by a periodic dip in the brightness. This spacecraft is um, close, but it operates in the Ka band, and from a technical perspective I thought it may be quite interesting to build a converter which operated at 32 gig to see whether um, it was possible to detect. So five kilohertz of span, um, carrier at 32 gig, um, local test oscillator to make sure the um, system is 
uh, working. This image took a month to gather, and that involved spending two hours per evening manually tracking the spacecraft, waiting for the signal. And I only later found out that the spacecraft points to Earth once a month to do a data download, and this literally was the final day before giving up. So the carrier appeared, and it was um, uh, good KA band DX, I would say. So a uh, few slides about the future of uh, my ground um, station. Obviously, in an ideal world, I could persuade the wife to let me have a bigger antenna and uh, you know a three or four meter dish, but uh, somehow I don't think that's going to happen. So I um, have to optimize what I have at the moment. The plan is to, count, uh, is to uh, design a subreflector, and that should increase the antenna efficiency a little bit and uh, lower the overall system noise figure because the feed horn will be pointing at the subreflector and any, o any overspill will uh, point at the sky, which is generally cold, whereas at the moment, obviously, the feed is at the centre of the dish and any overspill has uh, vegetation and uh, other garden stuff. So uh, this is a design for the profile. Um, it needs to be machined and uh, bolted uh, onto the dish. Um, the 32 gig stuff at the moment is a bit of a mess and it needs integrating properly so it can be quickly uh, switched out. The um, 26 gig system, which I built a few years ago um, to receive Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, currently listens to the Bell Hill Beacon on 24 gig um, because it's in the passband, but I need to get the uh, signal from the Lunar Recon Orbiter. And then the last on the list is to try a uh, detection of Voyager and, uh, and get the signal for that. Um, we were discussing it at lunch today. That will typically involve about an eight-hour track, so the, um, the shack reference has to remain within one hertz over uh, eight hours. The antenna has to track the spacecraft properly, have to integrate all the signals, tens of thousands of uh, samples of averaging, and you may see something a tenth of a dB over the noise floor. But I think for Voyager, that would be uh, awesome. <coughs> so other futures of amateur DSM. Um, the nice thing about this is the spacecraft are all going away from us. So when you've got your system optimised and you've squeezed every last dB out of it, you only have to wait a few months and the spacecraft are further away, so it gives you something else to um, a, a continually weaker signal to, to optimise. Loads of new missions are being launched, so it, is, um, it gives us something to uh, look at. So recently, obviously, we've got rid of Cassini and um, the Rosetta probe, and Stereo B is... Uh, broken, so um, we, we need a few more spacecraft, but they are uh, coming. If you're interested in um, the, AM, the AMSAT Mars missions, then DSN stuff can provide an excellent grounding in you know, how you track another planet, how you comp uh, calculate Doppler, what sort of things you have to take into account when you're looking at interplanetary um, spacecraft, and it, it's also quite nice to think about um, solar, systems, uh, solar system dynamics and how things in our solar system move. And it is quite good um, food for thought. Um, I try to talk to my wife about this, and uh, I usually know when I've gone too far when she's face down in the meal, um, fast asleep. <laughs> but uh, then I stop talking. And um, finally, data demodulation and decoding is possible. So there's an amateur station in uh, Germany who has taken uh, stereo A data um, with a seven-meter dish and uh, fed that back to NASA, which is uh, really good. So that's the end. Has anyone got any questions? You can take a photo of this, and it has um, the uh, links which are in the next slide and uh, the, a link to the Yahoo group and all that sort of stuff. Um, it is perfectly 100% safe, and uh, et cetera. Um, but for most normal people, there are the uh, URLs and uh, I'll leave that up in case anyone's got a question. There we go. Thank you very much. Oops, that work? Yes, thank you very much. I, for one, found that quite interesting, um, although I think I'd have problems getting even a 1.8 metre dish in my garden. I don't think I'd get permission. Um, I think planners might have a go as well, because I'm on the side of a hill, so it will be seen. Thank you very much. Any questions, anyone? Yeah. Turn at the back.
Yeah, great talk. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, I, I got a little bit confused right at the beginning when uh, you said that you were slaving off the Madrid uh, pointing, but then you also said you were, had your own pointing system. Um, so are you got, you're just running off your own system now, are you? Right, so um, the majority of the ephemeris data um, is computed from my home location, but the spacecraft are sufficiently far away that if I take the ASEL pointing data from Madrid and apply a correction, then I can slave off an antenna there. And what that enables basically is, um, uh, say for example, there's something else to do, but I want to take some DSN signals. Um, I can, uh, you know, point it at a Madrid uh, antenna, and uh, take that data, take the frequency information which is um, provided, and uh, auto tune my receiver, auto point the antenna and then take some uh, screenshots automatically. So it basically enables um, unattended uh, DX. So I would say most, you know, 90% of the time it is local ephemeris data for my station, but, you know, if uh, the kids want to do something or I need to be away, but there's something I want to catch, then it gets slaved off uh, Madrid. Uh, thank you, Paul. V obviously very interesting. Could you just give us some details about the dish? looks like a petal dish. Is it a very expensive Yeah, one? so um, the dish, the it's uh, a KU antenna, and it was um, made by NEC in about 85 for their um, first home satellite TV receiver. Um, it is uh, petals, so six petals. You, you don't really see them uh, too often. Most of the petalized stuff now is very thin aluminium sheet. But this is uh, quite nice. It's about three mil um, aluminium uh, plate, um, fairly heavy duty. It's kept its profile. Um, it, uh, you know, I haven't had it uh, in use since the 80s. But when I was given it in the in the 80s, it was stored on a pallet in a wooden box, so it was um, uh, not damageable. But it's you know, it's a I would say a um, a heavy duty sat TV antenna uh, fr from the good old days. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, as uh, a complete newbie, uh, how would you recommend having a go at this? What's the best route? What's the best route? So um, I would say it depends whether you want to build all of the stuff or whether you want to buy it. So if you want to buy, you can go to DB6NT and buy a down converter. And with a small antenna, so a six, uh, maybe a 90 or a 1.2, you could um, fairly cheaply get on air and pick some signals from Stereo uh, A and probably Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and that would give you some um, reasonable DX over a couple of hundred million K. Um, if you want the stuff which is further out, you, you really need a minimum of probably a 1.2 or 1.5 if you want to get Juno. Um, for Cassini, I estimate based on the correct uh, uh, back of envelope calculations that a 1.2 would have done it. But, you know, it, it really depends whether you want to build the stuff or buy it. Any other questions? A 1.8 metre dish would be adequate, more than adequate. Yeah, you, you know, stuff out to about, um, well, now about 800 million K um, with a 1.8 is easily doable. And it's, um, uh, I probably check Juno spacecraft a couple of times a week. And that is literally, um, I think, what HF people would say, an armchair copy. So you click the uh, dish tracker and the FFT, and you can detect it in the waterfall. But in terms of deep space network, it's an armchair copy. So yeah, a 1.8. OK. I think any more? I don't think so. Right. Can we all say thank you in the usual way? Please? Thanks.